Welcome to Hagia Sophia Mosque, also known as Hagia Sophia. This iconic structure has a rich history that spans over 1,500 years, serving as a cathedral, a mosque, and now a museum on upper section and mosque at basement. Join us on a journey through its breathtaking courtyard and magnificent interior. As we begin in the courtyard, notice the beautiful blend of Byzantine and Ottoman architecture. The mosque's exterior is adorned with intricate mosaics and towering minarets, added during the Ottoman period. This area served as a gathering place for worshippers and a tranquil spot for reflection. We now enter through the imperial gate, historically reserved for the emperor and his entourage. The grandeur of this entrance sets the stage for the splendor that lies within. The large bronze doors are a testament to the craftsmanship of the era. As you step into the nave, look up to witness the awe-inspiring dome. Spanning 31 meters in diameter and 55 meters high, it seems to float weightlessly. This architectural marvel was a groundbreaking achievement in the 6th century and remains a wonder today. On the walls, you'll find exquisite mosaics, some dating back to the 9th century. These depict various religious scenes and figures, including Christ Pantocrator and the Virgin Mary. Despite periods of iconoclasm and the conversion of the building into a mosque, many mosaics have been preserved. When Constantinople fell to the Ottomans in 1453, Hagia Sophia was converted into a mosque. Sultan Mem II added Islamic elements such as the mirab, minbar, and minarets. These features beautifully coexist with the original Byzantine architecture. The large medallions bearing the names of Allah, Muhammad, and the first four caliphs are prominent features of the interior. These calligraphic masterpieces were added in the 19th century by Sultan Abdulmasid and showcase the Islamic art of the period.
Moving to the upper galleries, you get a closer look at the mosaics and a panoramic view of the entire interior. These galleries were once reserved for the emperor's family and other dignitaries. Imagine the view during a grand religious ceremony, filled with light and music. As we conclude our tour, reflect on the historical significance of Hagia Sophia. It stands as a symbol of the confluence of cultures and religions, bridging the gap between the Byzantine and Ottoman empires. Thank you for joining us on this journey through one of the world's most iconic monuments. Welcome to Sultanahmet Mosque Part, where history meets modernity. Here, a Bentley traffic police car stands in front of the iconic Hagia Sophia Mosque. This scene perfectly captures the blend of the old and new in this vibrant city, where centuries-old architecture and contemporary life coexist harmoniously. We now move to the front of Hagia Sophia Mosque, a masterpiece of Byzantine architecture that has witnessed over 1,500 years of history. Notice the beautiful decorative fountain, a symbol of Ottoman hospitality and a place for visitors to refresh themselves before entering the mosque. Across from Hagia Sophia, we see the majestic Sultanahmet Mosque, commonly known as the Blue Mosque, named for its stunning blue tiles that adorn its interior. As we walk towards the entrance, you can see the inviting seats that provide a perfect spot for relaxation and contemplation amidst this historical setting. Entering the front garden of the Blue Mosque, you're greeted by lush greenery and the serene ambience of this sacred place. In the inner courtyard, you'll find the central round ablution fountain, used for ritual purification before prayers, surrounded by four minarets marking the mosque's corners. The courtyard is framed by intricately decorated walls, showcasing the exquisite Ottoman tilework and calligraphy.
As we enter the Blue Mosque through the main door, the sense of grandeur is immediate. The mosque's vast interior is a testament to Ottoman architectural genius. Looking to the left and right, you'll see crowds of visitors, all marveling at the mosque's beauty. The red carpet underfoot adds to the mosque's rich, welcoming atmosphere. Above, the ceiling is adorned with Quranic verses and mesmerizing blue mosaics that give the mosque its name. The interplay of light and color creates a truly magical experience. The mosque's interior is dominated by its dome and cascading semi-domes. The main dome reaches a height of 43 meters, 141 feet. The weight of the dome is supported by four massive cylindrical pillars. The transition between the central dome and the pillars is achieved by four long, smooth pendentives. Smaller pendentives are used for transitions between the semi-domes and their exedry and between the hall's corner domes and the surrounding structure. The mosque's interior is dominated by its dome and cascading semi-domes. The main dome reaches a height of 43 meters, 141 feet. The weight of the dome is supported by four massive cylindrical pillars. The transition between the central dome and the pillars is achieved by four long, smooth pendentives. Smaller pendentives are used for transitions between the semi-domes and their exedry and between the hall's corner domes and the surrounding structure. At ground level, the focus of the prayer hall is the mirab, which is made of finely carved marble, with a makarna's niche and a two inscription panels above it. It is surrounded by many windows. To the right of the mirab is the richly decorated minbar, or pulpit, where the imam stands when he is delivering his sermon at the time of noon prayer on Fridays or on holy days. The minbar is crafted from elaborately carved marble, with a summit covered by a gold-covered conical cap. The mosque has been designed so that even when it is at its most crowded, everyone in the mosque can see and hear the imam, with the exception of the areas behind the mosque's large pillars. According to Avliya Shalebi, who saw the mosque in the 17th century, a hundred Qurans on lecterns inlaid with mother of pearl, all gifted by sultans and viziers, were placed near the mirab. The Hunkar Mafal, or Sultan's Loge, is an elevated platform situated in the southeast corner of the prayer hall, where the Sultan could pray. The platform has an L-shape and is supported on ten marble columns. It has its own mirab with rich decoration, which used to include gold leaf and a jade rose. The loge is reached from the outside via an imperial pavilion, a large L-shaped structure composed of a covered ramp leading up to two rooms where the Sultan could retire to rest along with an enclosed portico or balcony on the south side overlooking the sea. These retiring rooms became the headquarters of the Grand Vizier during the suppression of the rebellious Genissary Corps in 1826. This auxiliary structure, which is awkwardly integrated into the overall mosque design, is an innovation that appears here for the first time in Ottoman architecture. It was partly destroyed by a fire in 1912 and was subsequently restored.
The lower walls of the mosque, especially around the galleries, are covered in Iznik tiles, a style of tile work named after their main production center, Iznik, ancient Nicaea. Ahmed, I had a great appreciation for these tiles, and the production of tiles for his mosque occupied the entire Iznik industry during its construction. Starting in 1607, orders for tiles were sent out continuously, and in 1613, the Sultan even forbade the production and sale of tiles for any other purpose, so that his own commissions could be completed on time. A total of 21,043 tiles, featuring over 50 different designs, are found inside the mosque. Some panels were designed specifically for the mosque, while others seem to have been reused from other buildings and amassed here, including lower quality tiles added during later repairs. The finest tiles are found on the walls of the upper gallery on the north wall, though these are difficult for most visitors to see today. They constitute a virtual museum of tile design from this period with motifs including cypress trees, flowers, and fruit in a range of colors including blue, green, red, black, and turquoise. Thank you for joining us on this tour of the Blue Mosque. This architectural marvel continues to inspire awe and reverence, standing as a symbol of Istanbul's rich cultural heritage. Descend into the depths of Istanbul and uncover the mystique of the Basilica Cistern, a subterranean marvel of Byzantine engineering. With its forest of ancient columns rising from the water, this underground palace, once a reservoir for the Great Palace of Constantinople, now enchants visitors with its eerie beauty and fascinating history. Walk amidst the softly glowing pillars, spot the enigmatic Medusa heads, and let the whispers of centuries past echo in this hidden gem beneath the bustling streets of Istanbul. Dive into the shadows of the past and experience the magic of the Basilica Cistern. If you like our videos and content and want them to come more, please subscribe to our channel also comment and like our videos, thank you in advance.
Our next video part will be about Top Copy Palace. Stay tuned. The Top Copy Palace, Turkish, Top Copy Sarayi, Ottoman Turkish, Romanized, Opepu Sarayi, Lit. Canon Gate Palace, or the Siralio, is a large museum and library in the east of the Fadi district of Istanbul in Turkey. From the 1460s to the completion of Dalmabas Palace in 1856, it served as the administrative center of the Ottoman Empire and was the main residence of its sultans. Construction, ordered by the Sultan Mem the Conqueror, began in 1459, six years after the conquest of Constantinople. Top copy was originally called the New Palace, Yeni Saray or Saray I Sedadaya Meyer, to distinguish it from the Old Palace, Eski Saray or Saray I Adekaya Meyer, in Bayezet Square. It was given the name Top Copy, meaning Canon Gate, in the 19th century. The complex expanded over the centuries, with major renovations after the 1509 earthquake and the 1665 fire. The palace complex consists of four main courtyards and many smaller buildings. Female members of the Sultan's family lived in the harem, and leading state officials, including the Grand Vizier, held meetings in the Imperial Council building. The Top Copy Palace, Turkish, Top Copy Sarayi, Ottoman Turkish, Romanized, Opepu Sarayi, Lit. Canon Gate Palace, or the Siralio, is a large museum and library in the east of the Fadi district of Istanbul in Turkey. From the 1460s to the completion of Dalmabas Palace in 1856, it served as the administrative center of the Ottoman Empire and was the main residence of its sultans. Construction, ordered by the Sultan Mem the Conqueror, began in 1459, six years after the conquest of Constantinople. Top copy was originally called the New Palace, Yeni Saray or Saray I Sedadaya Meyer, to distinguish it from the Old Palace, Eski Saray or Saray I Adekaya Meyer, in Bayezet Square. It was given the name Top Copy, meaning Canon Gate, in the 19th century. The complex expanded over the centuries, with major renovations after the 1509 earthquake and the 1665 fire. The palace complex consists of four main courtyards and many smaller buildings. Female members of the Sultan's family lived in the harem, and leading state officials, including the Grand Vizier, held meetings in the Imperial Council building. The palace complex is located on the Siralio Point, Sare Bernu, a promontory overlooking the Golden Horn, where the Bosphorus Strait meets the Marmara Sea. The terrain is hilly, and the palace itself is located at one of the highest points close to the sea. During Greek and Byzantine times, the Acropolis of the ancient Greek city of Byzantium stood here. After Sultan Mem II's conquest of Constantinople, known since 1930 in English as Istanbul, in 1453, the Great Palace of Constantinople was largely in ruins. The Ottoman court was initially set up in the Old Palace, Eski Saray, today the site of Istanbul University, in Bayezet Square. Mem II ordered that construction of Topkapi Palace begin in 1459. According to an account of the contemporary historian Kratobulus of Imbrus, the Sultan took care to summon the very best workmen from everywhere, masons and stonecutters and carpenters for he was constructing great edifices, which were to be worth seeing and should in every respect vie with the greatest and best of the past. Accounts differ as to when construction of the inner core of the palace started and was finished. Critobulus gives the dates 1459 to 1465, other sources suggest construction was completed in the late 1460s.
If you like our videos and content and want them to come more, please subscribe to our channel also comment and like our videos, thank you in advance. Mem II established the basic layout of the palace. His private quarters would be located at the highest point of the promontory. Various buildings and pavilions surrounded the innermost core and winded down the promontory towards the shores of the Bosphorus. The entire complex was surrounded by high walls, some of which date back to the Byzantine Acropolis. This basic layout governed the pattern of future renovations and extensions. The layout and appearance of Top Kapi Palace was unique amongst not only European travelers, but also Islamic or Oriental palaces. European travelers described it as irregular, asymmetric, non-axial, and of unmonumental proportions. Ottomans called it the Palace of Felicity. A strict, ceremonial, codified daily life ensured imperial seclusion from the rest of world. One of the central tenets was the observation of silence in the inner courtyards. The principle of imperial seclusion is a tradition that was codified by Mem II in 1477 and 1481 in the Canonine Code, which regulated the rank order of court officials, the administrative hierarchy, and protocol matters. This principle of increased seclusion over time was reflected in the construction style and arrangements of various halls and buildings. The architects had to ensure that even within the palace, the sultan and his family could enjoy a maximum of privacy and discretion, making use of grilled windows and building secret passageways. Later sultans made various modifications to the palace, though Mem II's basic layout was mostly preserved. The palace was significantly expanded between 1520 and 1560, during the reign of Suleiman the Magnificent. The Ottoman Empire had expanded rapidly, and Suleiman wanted his residence to reflect its growing power. The chief architect in this period was the Persian Aladdin, also known as Asim Ali. He was also responsible for the expansion of the harem. In 1574, after a great fire destroyed the kitchens, Mimar Sinan was entrusted by Sultan Selim II to rebuild the damaged parts of the palace. Mimar Sinan restored and expanded not only the damaged areas, but also the harem, baths, the privy chamber, and various shoreline pavilions. By the end of the 16th century, the palace had acquired its present appearance. The palace is an extensive complex rather than a single monolithic structure, with an assortment of low buildings constructed around courtyards, interconnected with galleries and passages. Few of the buildings exceed two stories, citation needed, seen from above, the palace grounds are divided into four main courtyards and the harem. The first courtyard was the most accessible, while the fourth courtyard and the harem were the most inaccessible. Access to these courtyards was restricted by high walls and controlled with gates. Apart from the four to five main courtyards, Various other small to mid-sized courtyards exist throughout the complex. Estimates of the total size of the complex varies from around 592,600 square meters, 146.4 acres, to 700,000 square meters, 173 acres. To the west and south, the complex is bordered by the large Imperial Flower Park, known today as Gulhang Park. Various related buildings such as small summer palaces, kassir, pavilions, kiosks, kosk, and other structures for royal pleasures and functions formerly existed at the shore in an area known as the Fifth Courtyard, but have disappeared over time due to neglect and the construction of the shoreline railroad in the 19th century. 
The last remaining seashore structure that still exists today is the basket maker's kiosk, constructed in 1592 by Sultan Murad III. Imperial Gate. The main street leading to the palace is the Byzantine Processional Mies Avenue, known today as Divanyolu, Council Street. This street was used for imperial processions during the Byzantine and Ottoman era. It leads directly to the Hagia Sophia and turns northwest towards the palace square to the Fountain of Ahmed III. The Imperial Gate is the main entrance into the first courtyard. The Sultan would enter the palace through the Imperial Gate, Turkish, Babai Humayun, meaning Royal Gate in Persian, or Sultanat Kapizi, located to the south of the palace. This massive gate, originally dating from 1478, is now covered in 19th century marble. Its central arch leads to a high domed passage, gilded Ottoman calligraphy adorns the structure at the top, with verses from the Quran and Tugras of the Sultans. The Tugras of Mem II and Abdulaziz, who renovated the gate, have been identified. According to old documents, there was a wooden apartment above the gate area until the second half of the 19th century. It was used as a pavilion by Mem, a depository for the properties of those who died inside the palace without heirs and the receiving department of the treasury. It has also been used as a vantage point for the ladies of the harem on special occasions. First Courtyard Surrounded by high walls, the first courtyard, Ayavlu or Alai Maidani, functioned as an outer precinct or park and is the largest of all the courtyards of the palace. The steep slopes leading towards the sea had already been terraced under Byzantine rule. 26. Some of the historical structures of the first courtyard no longer exist. The structures that remain are the former imperial mint, Darfaniya Meyer, constructed in 1727, the Church of Hagia Irene and various fountains. The Byzantine Church of Hagia Irene was used by the Ottomans as a storehouse and imperial armory. This courtyard was also known as the Court of the Genissaries or the Parade Court. Court officials and Genissaries would line the path dressed in their best garb. Visitors entering the palace would follow the path towards the Gate of Salutation and the second courtyard of the palace. The large Gate of Salutation, also known as the Middle Gate, Turkish, or to copy, leads into the palace and the second courtyard. This crenellated gate has two large, pointed octagonal towers. Its date of construction is uncertain, the architecture of the towers appears to be of Byzantine influence. An inscription at the door dates this gate to at least 1542. The gate is richly decorated with religious inscriptions and monograms of sultans. Passage through the gate was tightly controlled and all visitors had to dismount, since only the sultan was allowed to enter the gate on horseback. This was also a Byzantine tradition taken from the Chalke Gate of the Great Palace, citation needed, the fountain of the executioner, Selit Sesmisi, is where the executioner purportedly washed his hands and sword after a decapitation, though there is disagreement about whether the fountain was actually used for this purpose. It is located on the right side when facing the gate of salutation from the first courtyard.
Harem, Harem I Humayun, occupied one of the sections of the private apartments of the Sultan. It contained more than 400 rooms. The harem was home to the Sultan's mother, the Balid Sultan, the concubines and wives of the Sultan, and the rest of his family, including children and their servants. The harem consists of a series of buildings and structures, connected through hallways and courtyards. Every service team and hierarchical group residing in the harem had its own living space, clustered around a courtyard. The number of rooms is not determined, with probably over 100, of which only a few are open to the public. These apartments, dares, were occupied respectively by the harem eunuchs, the chief harem eunuch, Darussad Agassi, the concubines, the queen mother, the sultan's consorts, the princes, and the favorites. There was no trespassing beyond the gates of the harem, except for the sultan, the queen mother, the sultan's consorts and favorites, the princes, and the concubines, as well as the eunuchs guarding the harem. The harem wing was only added at the end of the 16th century. Many of the rooms and features in the harem were designed by Mimar Sinan. The harem section opens into the second courtyard, Divan Maidani, which the gate of carriages, Arabalar Kapizi, also opens to. The structures expanded over time towards the Golden Horn side and evolved into a huge complex. The buildings added to this complex from its initial date of construction in the 15th century